Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining me for another episode of the Horses Advocate podcast. Uh, I had a request by one of the members. She's also a former student, a graduate of the Horses Advocate, or I should say the Horsemanship Dentistry uh, School. And she asked me to discuss temporomandibular joints in horses. And what is TMJ? Uh, what do I know about it? How does it affect the horse in chewing? And I thought that was a brilliant question because a lot of people don't understand what the TM joint is. Uh, in fact, a lot of people say to me, does my horse have TMJ? And I'm a little bit of a wise guy. So I said, well, yes, in fact, it has two, two TMJs. And they look at me and they don't understand. I said, well, TMJ stands for temporomandibular joints. And the horse has two of them. So do you. Uh, one on each side below the ears, and they are uh, where the mandible or the jaw hinges against the skull. So your a horse has TMJ, absolutely, has two of them. So when they say, okay, don't be a smart aleck, you know what I mean. I refer them to what my own dentist said. And she said, uh, it's temporomandibular joint syndrome because it's hotly debated, her words, not mine, hotly debated, whether the joint causes pain that then causes the teeth to have a problem, meaning something outside the mouth is causing it, or something inside the mouth is causing the joints to go bad, and therefore it needs adjusting. And I think, again, anthropomorphizing the horse is not in the best interest mainly because the horse's temporomandibular joint is not the same as a human's. So we shouldn't be applying human thoughts to it. The human uh, mandible moves, according to my dentist, about 2000 times per day for chewing, I assume. Maybe not for speaking, but certainly chewing. A horse, on the other hand, chews between 10,000 and 40,000 chews per day. So an average of 25,000 chews. Now, Dr. Catherine Haupt, Professor Emeritus over at Cornell, uh, she did the study. She actually counted how many times a horse chews in a day, and she had a range of between 10,000 and 40,000 chews per day. So if you take the medium, median is 25,000. That's the number right between 10,000 and 40,000. And you multiply that by 30 days, that's 750,000 chews in a day. A human at 2,000 chews is 730,000 chews in a year. So a horse will chew more in one month than you will chew in a year. So they have a joint that's working pretty well. If you want to take that out to six months, it's 4.5 million. And at one year, it's 9 million chews. 9 million versus a human 730,000. So... Would you assume that because the horse is chewing so much that they would get more of a syndrome or a damage or pain from a temporomandibular joint? Or would you assume that the horses live for millions, you know, 55 million years? Yeah, 55 million years. <laughs> Sorry for the cough. So if a horse has lived 55 million years, that means... Um, the joint is probably doing a good job. In fact, if you wanted to just make a little thought process as you're mucking your stalls or driving your car, let's just pause for a moment and ask yourself, what muscle moves more? What joint moves the most in the horse? And some of you might say the heart and the valves, and you'd probably be correct. But I mean, as far as skeletal muscles goes, are, is it the limbs? Is it the tail swishing? Is it, you know, the ears twitching? Or is it the jaw moving? And I think the jaw is going to be right up there in the top three. And the reason I say this is because in the older horse, it's losing a lot of muscle. They'll lose top line, but they'll also lose their masseter muscles, which are the cheek muscles on each side. They become a flat bone. And they look very old at that point as they've lost all their muscle there. It's a very uh, active muscle that will be depleted after a while in their ancient days. So if you dissect out a horse's skull and you look at the joint of the temporomandibular joints, temporomandibular, mandibular is obviously mandible, temporo is the temporal 
uh, temporalis muscles, temporalis muscles. Good grief. There goes my anatomy right at the window. Um, Petrus temple bone. Uh, and that's where the joint occurs. And it is a joint that moves in three directions. So if you take the finger, any finger on your body and you wiggle it, you know, straight up and close it back down into fist, you'll notice that that joint moves in two dimensions, you know, extension and, and um, contraction or flexion, extension and flexion. But they don't go sideways. They have nice collateral ligaments that prevent that. And if it does go sideways or if your ankle goes sideways, it's called a sprain and it hurts like heck. But if you take your jaw right now and just move it sideways, just throw your chin to left and to the right, open it wide, close it, um, bite on something on one side and not on the other. And notice how your jaw just adapts to the terrain. You know, it's, it is so uh, flexible. Uh, the joint is absolutely amazing. And I'm not doubting that people get temporomandibular joint syndrome where they get headaches or their jaw is locked, they can't open it. I know uh, almost every one of us has had that happen at some point, but I don't think it's the joint. I think that you have some ligaments and tendons up there that might have a little bit of a, of a catch and that can happen, but I think the joint is okay. But don't take my word for it. Um, there's a veterinarian out of Saskatchewan. I love this. I, I do this. Oh, okay. I just had, I, you know, his name goes in and out of my brain. I love the guy. He's, he's just so uh, easy to listen to and so thorough in his uh, work. His name is Dr. James Carmalt. And he's talked at many, given many lectures at the American Association of Equine Practitioners. I'll never forget the first time he did it. I almost stood up and gave a whoop and a holler at the very back of the room because I tend to kind of um, hide in the back and, and slog through some of the stuff that people say because I'm not always in agreement with it, as you guys listening to me know. But when it came to the temperament deep of the joint, he decided to do a retrospective study, which means he went back in time as far back as he could go. And he looked at all, all the things that he could find um, that registered temperament deep of the joint or TMJ in the computer. And he didn't find any primary temperament deep of the joint bone disease uh, with the exception of hit by a car, you know, baseball bat or some sort of trauma. Um, and that makes sense. You know, you have trauma to a joint, you're going to have traumatic after effects. But primary temperament mandibular joint disease, couldn't find any mention of it, not in studies that were done, not in uh, case reports, nothing. And that's why I almost stood up and whooped and hollered because with working with horses since 1973 and working with horses teeth since 1983, I have not seen a horse that didn't want to open its jaw because the joint of the jaw hurt. I've seen them resist for many other reasons. Um, number one being, I don't want you to stick anything inside my mouth because every time you stick something in there, it tastes bad or I don't like it, like dewormers. Uh, pain from the sharp teeth going up and down the cheeks. I've seen that a lot. And a little bit of painkiller and the horse opens up its mouth just fine. Um, and then floating teeth and getting rid of all the sharp points in a non-medicated horse. The movement of the jaw is extreme as they rediscover what it's like to move the jaw without uh, any pain from the sharp teeth. So I started to realize that temperament of the joints aren't really a problem in horses. And that's been the stance I've had since the beginning of time or since I've been thinking about it. And to have Dr. Carmel come up and say, we haven't seen any cases of it, just thrilled me to no end. But that wasn't the end of the story. Um, the following year, he gave another talk where he had injected the joint, one of the temporal mandibular joints, and they're very easy to palpate. You can ask your vet to show you where the TM joints are on a horse. Uh, you just stick your finger right there. It's just so simple. Um, and he injected into one joint a substance that caused excruciating pain if injected in a fetlock joint. And the point of this is it's a temporary, I know it sounds disgusting, but uh, this is how they train um, some veterinarians. 
students uh, to recognize um, lame horses. They would inject it, and then the horse become head bobbing lame, and then people could see that, and it's a start. It causes no damage. Uh, it just is a stinging sensation, and the horse gets over it, and there's no no harm, no foul. Uh, and you can argue that if you want. I don't know if anybody's doing that anymore, but um, it's got a really good safety track record. So he decided to inject one fetlock joint and the opposite temporomandibular joint. So he would do the right temporomandibular joint and left front fetlock. And he'd wait the appropriate time. And then he would walk or jog the horse off and he'd be head not bobbing lane. I mean, couldn't, I mean, could barely put any weight on it. It's obvious the horse is being affected by it. But then they would take a look at the horse chewing and there's absolutely no difference in the way the horse chewed. And I thought that was pretty cool. You know, in other words, they didn't seem to have the same reaction in the joint. But he wasn't willing to take his word for it or believe his eyes. So he ended up putting a costume on the horse's head that had electronic diodes that fed into a computer. And this costume is the same costume that is worn in movies when they want to depict uh, a creature. It's actually a human doing the acting. And yet through computer animation, it becomes Golem of uh, my little precious in The Hobbit. Uh, or if you saw Planet of the Apes, uh, and you saw the ape riding the horse, that was actually a human. And just a little side note, I know one of those humans. Uh, she was a client of mine, is a client of mine, uh, and she is now a veterinarian. She actually went through vet school and has graduated and is practicing um, in, uh, I think it's California right now. But uh, she was one of those apes <laughs> that was riding the horse and she wore the suit. So Dr. Carmel put this uh, suit on the, a uh, horse's head and uh, watched how the horse chewed. And he said that basically these uh, horses chew in a circular pattern and it's either clockwise or counterclockwise. And as soon as I said that, I almost stood up again and gave out another whoop because I've been saying this for a decade at least that they're left-handed chewers or right-handed chewers. Each horse is different. Most horses make the teeth on the left sharper than the right, almost universally, just like most of us are mostly right-handed in writing, uh, but some of us are left-handed. It's just a preference. There's no right or wrong. It's just a preference. And when you eat something, you're usually chewing on one side of your mouth. You don't separate it. So you have equal parts on the left and right. You just chew one side and then maybe you switch over to the other side, but you basically choose one side and swallow it. And I've been saying this about horses forever. And to have Dr. Carmel actually measure this was just fascinating. So we all know that horses chew in a rotation. So the upper jaw opens up and goes to one side and then closes and comes across to the opposite side and then raises up. So it's a grinding pattern from right to left or from left to right. And these horses had a preference. But what was even more interesting is after he injected that joint, then the um, rotation went the other way. So if they're right-handed or clockwise chewers, they would become counterclockwise chewers with the injection. But your eyes couldn't tell the difference, but they would continue to chew as if nothing was wrong. They just went ahead and chewed until the pain went away. I was just like flabbergasted. I said, so basically there's no primary temporomandibular joint disease. You could get some secondary temporomandibular joint, but it's probably secondary to painful teeth. So it turns out that there's a whole uh, group of equine dentists that has elected to believe that the temporomandibular joint is at the root of all problems. And they say that you have to balance the mouth with filing the front teeth down because it's a triangle between the front teeth, the incisors, and the left and right temporomandibular joint. And once you get that balanced, then the horse can actually functionally move their mouth in an equilibrated pattern or balanced pattern. And I've always thought that this didn't make sense to me. It's like putting the, um, the, the cause, um, is actually the event that's secondary to the primary cause. So they've, to me, they've got it reversed. To me, they are, the horse is responding to how the teeth feel 
to the horse. And they are moving away from pain and are going to alter the way they chew and the way they move their tongue. And from that tongue movement, they're going to shape the incisors into various shapes that we've all seen. Um, instead of the incisors going straight and level from left to right, as you look straight at them in the mouth, they're going left to right. Um, you might see some that are slanted, uh, sheared. Uh, some of them have a smile. So um, they're long in the bottoms and they curve up uh, or also a frown where it goes up and down. My own personal horse had a V-shaped, uh, which is very unique. I've very rarely seen a V-shaped horse and I would watch him chew and the tongue would go out to the left and go out to the right and go out to the left and go out to the right. And what I discovered was, and there's no science proof behind this, this is an observational study, is that the horse is going to move the tongue in, a, uh, in the least painful way possible. And if you continue to file the teeth from a young age, so there are no sharp edges and the horse isn't avoiding that pain, those teeth basically stay straight across. The front incisors remain straight across. But a lot of these horses that have never been floated or only had the uh, first couple of cheek teeth floated, but the back teeth not floated, those sharp points in some horses can really affect the way the horse moves the tongue and they will have an altered shape to their incisors. That's my hypothesis. Uh, no real proof has ever come out. It's just my observation that when horses are filed as a routine basis, every six months, year after year, the incisors remain straight across. And as Melissa said to me once, uh, Doc, I can tell that the horses that you've been doing for several years, to which I said, why? She says, because the teeth are lining up, the cheek teeth line up as if they've all worn braces. They are absolutely uh, perfectly aligned. And those that are have altered, like the 25-year-old uh, mini that I worked on this morning, uh, as I go back there and file, the teeth are loose because the tongue doesn't even want to move up against the teeth. They're so sharp. And the horse hadn't been done in at least three years and probably longer. So here's a horse avoiding getting the tongue on these teeth and it's having a tough, tough time chewing. And the teeth are getting loose and they're falling out. So I know if I check this horse in another two months, all those teeth will be solid in the horse's mouth as the tongue does its job of pushing up against the teeth and forcing the tooth to become stronger in the socket. It's really a miraculous thing to see. But my whole attention is on making the mouth comfortable, making the, the movement of the jaw comfortable and making the tongue comfortable. And when that happens, we don't get temper mandibular joint disease in horses. I don't have a client coming up to me and saying, well, I shouldn't say it that way. Those horses that are routinely done often in the body works, the temper mandibular joints aren't a problem. That said, um, I've had plenty of chiropractics and I've had other people come up to me and say, I think this horse has TMJ. And I say, well, what do you mean? He says, well, there's an asymmetry here. So what I've learned is I'll go up to a horse straight on. So its nose is right into my chest and my left and right hand have reached up and are feeling the temper mandibular joints below each ear. And I stick my fingers right in the joint and I can feel that joint. And then I take, that's my index finger. And then I take my thumb on the back side. Actually, the thumb is on the joint. <laughs> anyway, and I slide down from the joint. So what I'm having between my thumb and my first finger is the connections of the soft tissue up in that area. It has part of the mandible, but also has the, the um, thick tendons in that area. And almost every horse I do this on, their left side is thicker than their right side. It is not symmetrical. And this goes back to horses having a preference of chewing one way or the other. In addition, in a few horses, if I pinch that area, they will be reactive on their left side and not reactive on their right. And that means that it's just sore. So after floating these horses, that tends to go away. So if you're a chiropractic or a veterinarian or some sort of professional who works in this field where you're actually feeling these TM joints, go up there and feel the TM joint and drop down about an inch and squeeze 
uh, between your finger, your first finger and your thumb, just squeeze that thick area. It's about an inch wide, you know, two and a half centimeters. I did that in my head. Um, and on the left side, their left side, their, you know, the horse's left side, almost every horse that you do this on, it'll be thicker on the left side. And some of them, when you squeeze that left side, they'll move away from you because it hurts. Whereas the right side is no big deal. And that I find fascinating. I mean, that is just, to me, um, an observation that is consistent in all horses, all breeds uh, throughout the United States that I go see. And I think that's where a lot of people are getting this idea that a horse has a temper mandibular joint problem. It's not really the joint itself, it's the soft tissues that are around it. And if you can calm that area down, uh, the horse becomes more comfortable. So the number one, in my book, the number one thing to do is remove the cause, which is the sharp edges of the teeth. So the horse is now comfortable in moving the tongue and the jaw, and that pain goes away. Uh, second, you can use anti-inflammatories, either topical or systemic to get in there and see if the problem goes away. Uh, there are a lot of veterinarians now that are injecting the temper mandibular joint. And honestly, it's, it's an easy joint to hit. I mean, it's right there. Uh, you don't have to be skilled to clean that area, pop a needle in, boom, you put some stuff in. And then everyone says, oh my gosh, the horse went so much better. Um, but you also, I don't know, maybe affected the soft tissue around there, but you still aren't going to the root of the problem. Now, another thing, and this is really, really interesting. There's a veterinarian up in New York, uh, who's a friend of mine, who, um, was practicing veterinary medicine when I was thinking about going to vet school. So he's been around a long time. He's well-established. He's an icon in, in, the, in the New York area, uh, near uh, you know, New York City, north of there. And he opened up his own veterinary clinic. I mean, built a beautiful hospital and he bought a nuclear scintigraphy machine. And one day down in here in Florida, I caught him at a fast food place. Yes, fast food. And uh, I said, how's it going? He says, it's going great. Um, I just bought this nucleus integrity machine and I think you'd be interested in what I'm finding. I said, you know, I was curious. He said, I would bring every horse in, every horse that came in for a fetlock or a hawk or anything. And I would do a total body scan, head to tail, just to, uh, get an understanding of how this machine worked to get a feel for it. And he said, you bet you never guess what I found. I said, I'll bet you I will. I'll bet you the TM joints lit up. And he said, every one of them, every horse that came in for no matter what reason. And none of them had a temperament to the joint issue. Every one of the TM joints lit up like a Christmas tree. That was his quote. He says, it was so bad that I refuse to scan any temper mandibular joints in horses because I know they're going to light up and it's going to be meaningless to me. And I said to him, well, obviously they chew 25,000 chews a day. It's the most active joint in the body. Of course, it's going to have a blood flow up there that's going to be different. And, uh, and that, was, that was just like icing on my cake between Dr. Carmalton, uh, this veterinarian in um, New York, tell me about nucleus integrity or bone scan. Um, I like put it all to rest. I, you know, everybody comes up to me and they say, my horse has TMJ. Um, I say, no, it doesn't. Uh, it probably has some soft tissue around there and we're going to take care of it through the teeth. Um, and let's just see what happens. And sure enough, almost every one of them, and I say almost because I don't really get a hundred percent feedback, but of the feedback that I get, uh, whoever's investigating the horse and saying it's a temper mandibular joint problem basically says to me, uh, that doesn't have a TM joint problem anymore after the teeth are floated correctly. So if these people who believe that it's a balance between the temper mandibular joints and the incisors would do a study where all they did was they filed down the front teeth, which is what they think they have to do. They filed down the front teeth and then they, uh, uh, and don't do anything else. Don't file the cheek teeth at all. And then go back and see if they're still having a problem. That would be a worthy study. I mean, if we did a thousand horses that way, 
you know, 1,000, 500 that we didn't do anything, 500 we just filed the incisors, or maybe 1,500 horses add another 500 that all we do is the cheek teeth and didn't do the incisors, and look to see if an independent, uh, uninformed, meaning um, an unbiased observer, would look and analyze the temper mandibular joints and be randomized so he doesn't know which horse he's working on, and ask them, are they seeing and improving the temper mandibular joint? I would bet you, I would bet you that the horses whose cheek teeth are done are the ones that are going to be the outstanding uh, recipients of redu reduced um, temporal mandibular joint syndrome uh, that they're diagnosing. And that the incisors only or no treatment at all is not going to do a lick of good. That's my feeling. Uh, but that, again, is a study that nobody's willing to put their bucks up against because there's no money in it for them. Uh, you know, if they, if they spent the you know, $100,000 to keep these horses going for X amount of days and did all the studies and stuff. Um, they're not making any money out of it. So nobody's ever going to put that money up. Now, if I ever become a billionaire, maybe that's one of the studies I would do. And that would be a lot of fun. But it's not happening. So you'll just have to take these observational studies and common sense. Uh, if the, all these people want to do is file the incisors, uh, to help improve the temper mandibular joint, fine. Just file the incisors and say, look, go away for a month and let's come back and see how this is working. And if the temper mandibular joints are now balanced and everything's fine, um, that's great. But um, I think you're going to have to file the sharp edges that are affecting the tongue. And those are the very last cheek teeth, top and bottom, that are affecting the tongue and the cheek and the movement of the jaw. And in some horses with very low thresholds of pain, it only takes a pimple, just a small amount back there. It doesn't have to be an egregious uh, fractured tooth or something. It could be very small in some of these horses. So uh, one more story. Um, I had a horse once. This is, gosh, 20 years ago. And it was just south of here in Jupiter, Florida, that I floated the horse during the day. It gave me a little bit of trouble getting in the mouth, but it wasn't really bad. I floated it, everything was fine. I floated a couple of other horses, uh, finished up my day, went home. About 7 p.m., they call and said, uh, we're having trouble with the horse. And they said that the horse is just staring at its food, doesn't want to open its mouth, and is hungry, but can't open its mouth and doesn't want to eat. So I just, go on down. Uh, it's about eight o'clock at night when I get there. Um, and most of you who know how I float teeth, I don't use a speculum. Uh, I just use my hand and I stuck my hand in the horse's mouth and went all the way back on his right side and felt every tooth. And so the horse opened his mouth for me and everything was fine. Then I went to the left side and stuck my left hand, my left hand in on the horse's left side and the horse wouldn't open his mouth. He fought me. He said, no way this hurts. I said, well, that's interesting because a horse wasn't like that when I did his teeth. So luckily, I have a um, equine veterinarian slash chiropractic slash acupuncturist friend of mine who um, I believe is retired now, but he is well known in the um, uh, racetrack world and the hunter jump world uh, to do his work. And he's a magician, really nice guy. He gave me the book. Um, um, the web that has no weaver that teach taught me about Chinese medicine and what it really means. Uh, great guy. And he taught me how to do the temper mandibular joint uh, manipulation of the jaw to free up a, a stuck jaw. And I'd never used it before, but it's a pretty simple technique. So I went to the horse and I performed it. It took uh, a fraction of a second to do the horse blinked his eyes and moved his jaw and went right down to eating hay instantly. So I would say that the horse had locked his jaw, had had a problem with the jaw that by removing all the pain caused him to do something funny. Uh, we've all done that. Our jaw suddenly becomes locked and we don't panic. And we work it out and, and move on. And I think that's just what happened to this horse. Uh, they never had a problem after that. So um, I wouldn't call that temper mandibular joint disease. I would just say, well, the horse locked and the horse had, had not been floated by me in like ever. Uh, it'd been a long time. The teeth were horrifically sharp. And I took all those edges away and the horse basically 
um, had been relieved of pain and had wiggled his jaw and somehow caught it. Uh, so that was a happy ending. And in all my years of floating, that's the only time that has ever happened that's been brought to my attention. Nobody's ever called me up and said, Doc, you floated the teeth and now my horse can't eat at all. Uh, they'll say he's having some difficulty and they warm up out of it in like a couple of hours to maybe a couple of days. That's common. But to lock a jaw, one horse out of 75,000. So I think it's pretty rare. So that's my story about temporomandibular joints and temporomandibular joint syndrome in horses. I think it's um, a blown out of proportion problem in horses that is overlooking the primary cause, which is sharp teeth uh, that are affecting the movement of the, t of the tongue and the um, jaw. Uh, that's, that's where I stand on that. So this podcast is relatively short. Um, I'm always glad that you join me for it. Um, you notice that I don't put any commercials in. Uh, nobody sponsors me. I don't take money from anybody. Um, the cost, as somebody says on another podcast, there is a cost of listening to this podcast. And I'm like, yo, okay, you know, I'm afraid of the guy. Um, and that is uh, to tell others. And I would so greatly appreciate if you just shared this with somebody, uh, just reached out and say, hey, here's a pretty interesting podcast you might want to listen to. And whether you agree with me or disagree, that's not the point. It is just a point of view that I've got. Um, I'm not your vet, of course, uh, but I do put out some information based on almost 50 years of being with horses and almost 40 years as being a horse vet that I want to share with you guys, just so you get a different point of view. And you may not like my point of view. You may think that horses get temperament due to the joint disease. You may think that filing the incisors teeth are, is important. All I'm asking for you to do is to think and to discuss and to open up a dialogue. Uh, that's what these podcasts are all about. Also, the Horses Advocate is a great place for you to go to enjoy this type of banter, uh, to bring your point of view, to discuss things in a very friendly, uh, non-aggressive platform where we can go over things. Or if you have questions and say, hey, I just don't understand what you're talking about, become a member of the Horses Advocate. And that's where we talk about these things. We also put on an, a monthly uh, seminar. Uh, these seminars cover ranges from uh, driving a, a horse trailer, uh, which I have a ton of experience doing, uh, to fat metabolism in the cell and everything in between. I just uh, did one on preparing your horse for uh, the cold of winter and the hot heat of summer, uh, because there's some really cool things that a lot of people haven't talked about that I just want to get out there. So I've got another year of uh, these meetings already lined up in my head. We're also opening up to what we call open rounds with Doc T, where you can just call and banter back and forth and ask questions and get uh, your questions answered. So that's where I spend my time at the Horses Advocate. If you want to join me there, I would love it. Uh, support us and bring other people along. Let's make this the biggest, best, trustworthy, and safe community for horses uh, to help horses thrive in a human world. Thank you for listening. And I look forward to uh, hear, uh, talking with you next week. Bye. Hey everyone, Doc T here. Thank you for listening to my content. Would you do me a huge favor? Would you please subscribe, comment, like, thumbs up, and give a star review? However it's presented to you, I want you to do that. There are two reasons. The first, of course, is to improve this product. This way I know what you like, what you don't like, what I can improve upon, what topics you want me to cover. But more importantly, it's also gonna help others find me. And by doing that, you are now engaged in this mission of helping horses thrive in a human world. By you helping, we can reach others. And that I would be so grateful for. And remember, go to thehorsesadvocate.com for updates on this information. Thehorsesadvocate.com. And again, thank you so much for being here. Talk to you out.